Hi, my name is Ronnie Fomiel. I am a licensed pharmacist in the state of Michigan. I've been practicing since 1999 uh, here in the state of Michigan. And uh, I've been giving lectures throughout the state of Michigan on pharmacy law, on prescription drug abuse, on updating pharmacists throughout the state of Michigan on certain business practices. I'm also a, a consultant in the state of Michigan. And my law reviews have been all comprehensive. Um, there's not too many law reviews that combine Michigan law along with federal law, along with rules updates, and a few other topics. So um, the people that have come to the lectures have really enjoyed it. Um, I had uh, taped a couple of them, and uh, unfortunately, um, the tape, for whatever reason, didn't record properly. So I'm going to be posting some of this stuff online. I'm in the process of writing a book as well with updating all the pharmacy rules and regulations in the state of Michigan, and uh, which really, I think, is going to be beneficial to a lot of people. I've been a field manager, I've worked at long-term care, um, I've been a pharmacist, I've seen all aspects and the struggles in the state of Michigan uh, of different pharmacists and really a different way of looking at some of the rules and regulations. There's so much fear and, uh, and a lot of the fear around the rules and regulations has to do with lack of knowledge. I'm going to really try to simplify things uh, for you. Um, this lecture I think you're going to find is going to be very beneficial and at the end of the lecture you're going to see yourself. What I'm going to be doing is really the first time that state regulations along with federal regulations have all been combined into one. At the end of this one hour session, you really will become an expert at the most important rules and regulations impacting the pharmacy profession right now. At the same time, you will also know what to look for when different state inspectors come into the pharmacy. This was a lecture that I had given back on December the 15th and for whatever reason, it did not end up taping, so I'm just recreating the lecture so that I can post it for others to see um, at others' requests. So let's start with what has been deleted from the rules and regulations. If you look here, before, doctors could not add handwritten drugs to a pre-printed form. So if they had a list of drugs that were typed and they could just check off boxes, they were not allowed to add drugs to that. That has now changed. That rule has been deleted. Also, a doctor before could not prescribe a controlled substance and a non-controlled substance on the same form. And the reason behind that was so that patients, if a doctor wrote out a script for moxicillin and a, and a prescription for Vicodin, patients were just bringing in the prescriptions for the Vicodin and not the amoxicillin. Now doctors are allowed to do that. They can write a control and a non-control on the same form, but keep this in mind. You still have to file them separately. That is crucial to understand because of the fact that if you don't file them separately, then you're violating other rules and regulations that go back to the filing processes. So my suggestion, if a doctor does write a controlled substance and a non-control, make a copy of the prescription, use the copy for the non-control, and use the, the, the actual original for the control to file them separately. Also, before doctors were supposed to, they never did this, write how many drugs, if they wrote three drugs on a prescription, they were supposed to indicate that on the prescription. That's been deleted, uh, but, but as I said, uh, it wasn't like doctors followed that anyhow. Pharmacy licenses. You must post it in a visible area for the public to view. A couple key points to remember here. Please pay attention to when your license expires. Make sure that it's updated and in the pharmacy. If you're a floating pharmacist, always have a copy of the original license with you to take to different places. Now keep this in mind, the wallet licenses are usually not acceptable according to state inspectors, the majority of them. It all depends on the inspector that's coming in. Plus, your license has to be in the visible area where the public can view it. So uh, again, don't put yourself at risk. If you are one of those pharmacists that goes from pharmacy to pharmacy, make a copy of your original that's at your home store and keep that copy with you wherever the stores that you go to. Even though not required, DEA certificates and meth certificates, you should always pay attention to when they expire and make sure that they are up to date. A good practice also with pharmacists immunizing more and more is to make sure that you take your immunization certificates or make a copy of your immunization certificate with you to the different locations that you go to. Have it posted along with your CPR certificate. Again, watch out for those wallet licenses. I mean, they're good to have for reference and all that. But technically speaking, you should make a copy of your original license if you go to different places. CEs. Let's quickly review. Pharmacists need 30 hours of CE every two years. 10 hours has to be in live training. And one hour has to involve some form of pain management. 
The biggest mistakes, and pharmacists are being held more and more accountable to this, the biggest mistake that's made is that the fact that pharmacists, one, are signing off or registering online to renew their licenses before all of their CEs have been completed. That's not how it works. When you re-register re and reapply for your pharmacist license, you're pretty much signifying that, that I have finished all 30 hours of CE, and then you are submitting. Now, it doesn't. you don't have until June 30th of that year to finish all your CEs. You're saying that all your CEs are done. So finish all your CEs and then apply for your license. Also, audit periods go back four years, so two license periods. So you, technically speaking, can go back so two, back, two license periods back for you to get audited by the state. Um, a key thing here is something called the NAVP CE Monitor. The NAVP CE Monitor, and many of you have seen this, is that when you finish your CE, it automatically gets uploaded to this website to show that you've completed that CE. Now, what's happening more and more, and I can see this happening in the future, what is stopping the states from saying, okay, let's go to the CE monitor, let's see who says they have, it only shows 28 hours, even though the pharmacist might think they have 30 hours, and let's audit them. I can see that happening. So please pay attention when you're doing your CEs, make sure that all of your CEs are being sent to this. Um, a quick way of doing it is Google it, go to NAVP CE monitor, you'll see that on there, you just have to create a, a, an account and log into it. Um, and it's crucial to understand it because of the fact that more and more people um, are being audited these days for CEs. Um, how long are prescriptions valid for in the state of Michigan from the date that they are prescribed? So, and how many refills are allowed? Now, so many people get this question wrong. You'd be surprised. Non-control and Schedule 5. So a Schedule 5 control substance would be like Robitussin AC. There's one year and no limit on refill. People don't realize that about Schedule 5 control substances that they think it's like six months and five refills. It's not. It's actually uh, uh, the same thing as non-controls. Schedule three and four you can have is valid for six months from the date it's written, and five full refills. So what that means is that if someone's giving a Suboxone refill day after day after day after day, they don't have five refills. They actually can fill it as many times as needed up until those five full refills are remaining. So if a doctor writes 30 and five refills, that's literally 180 units or tablets or films. They can actually get it filled 180 times up until that five full refills. Lastly, Schedule 2, they're good for 90 days from the date they're written. No refills allowed, but a doctor can give you three separate prescriptions that are all dated on the same day. The biggest mistake that's made on this 90 day three script or whatever it is, is that the doctor dates it for the future month. So if the patient was seen on December 29th, then that patient, uh, the doctors are writing January 29th and February 29th. That's not legal. What it should do is that all three prescriptions should be dated on the same date, and a doctor should indicate a do not fill until date on that prescription. Now, how do you handle that? Uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about what you can change and what you can't change on a scheduled prescription or a ske any kind of scheduled prescription, and we'll get to that in a minute. So again, one year, no limit on refills, schedule three and four, six months, five full refills, schedule two, it's good for 90 days from the date it's written, and we, they can give three separate prescriptions um, as long as they do it properly. Non-controlled scripts. Prescriber who issues a prescription for non-controlled legend shall do the following. Let's talk about the manual signature. People get this confused all the time. What does it mean to have a manual script signature? So let's address this. Pretty much this. Every single prescription in the state of Michigan, if it's faxed in, if it is printed out from the doctor's office and given to the patient, if it's handwritten, has to have a wet signature or a manual signature on there. The law defined a manual signature, meaning that a signature is handwritten or computer generated if a prescription is electronically transmitted. So the only time that a computer generated signature is allowed is on an e-script. That's it. If the e-script for some reason defaults through the fax machine, it needs a manual signature. Now. Uh, board of pharmacies are auditing this. It's one of the biggest things that they stress inspectors and uh, stress when they're coming to the pharmacy. The next thing is also is around making sure that we have um, the signatures on controlled substances, especially. So you run into this problem about who has to sign a, a controlled substance prescription, and we'll get to that in a minute. But let's keep things simple again. All prescriptions need a wet signature. There cannot be stamp. They can't be computer generated. Uh, in a way you can tell is if you hold it up, you can see a signature that's pixelated. 
and it's a, if the signature is pixelated, it's computer generated, it's not legal in the state of Michigan. Now, um, what can you do with a lot of these things? It comes down to educating the physicians. A lot of physicians don't realize that these are not allowed. You'll see it sometimes from dentists that there's they're rubber stamping signatures and, and things of that nature. Just educate the doctor. A lot of times when you can just simply call the doctor and you can put verified by so-and-so. The only time you can't do that where you can't verify a signature and just put that on a script and fill it would be on a Schedule II controlled substance prescription. So the prescription shall contain all the following, the name, prescriber's printed name and address, drug name and strength and so forth. And again, if you want a printed copy of my lecture, I will make that available to you. Just email me and I'll send that over to you. Prescriptions phoned in must indicate the name of the person that you talked to at the doctor's office and the name of the person at the pharmacy who took the script. And that is crucial to put that in the bottom right of the corner of the, the prescription or wherever you feel is necessary, but make sure that you indicate who you spoke to and the person at the pharmacy that, that was spoken to. A key thing here, only a pharmacist may take an oral order for a controlled substance prescription or a prescription that is uh, a transfer. Technicians cannot take controlled substance prescriptions from doctor's office and they can't give controlled substance copies. Prescriptions that are received through a fax machine, as much as possible, do not cut off the date and time stamp that comes from that fax machine that's actually required. A lot of people don't realize that. So when it comes to your fax machine, a lot of that sending, the sending fax is usually the one that's stamping that fax and date and time stamp on there. So keep that on there. Do not get rid of that. Pharmacist initialing of prescriptions. Here's another change that occurred. Before, a pharmacist had to number, date, and initial a prescription. Or now, what's allowed is electronically initialing of the prescription. So a, a prescription can be numbered, dated, and now you can still initial if you're the final verifying pharmacist, but most computer systems, what happens now is when a, you have trackability of who checked that prescription. And if you go to it and there's an issue that has to come up, you can see if your computer system electronically initials final verification, who that final verifying pharmacist was, then that's all you need. You don't necessarily have to initial the back of prescriptions anymore. It's still a habit. I mean, I've seen it done. I've, I have many people that uh, it's gonna be very hard to break that practice, but just be aware that finally the rule is catching up where you don't have to initial the script as long as you can identify who the final verifying pharmacist was. A prescriber shall not prescribe more than either of the following on a single prescription. So what this is asking, how many scripts can a doctor write for on a pad? Let's keep it simple. If a doctor hand writes a prescription, four prescriptions is the max. If a doctor computer generates a prescription, they can go up to six prescriptions. And this is done so that scripts are not just all crammed in there and that it is easy to read for a pharmacist. You'll have some doctors that'll try to fit 15 prescriptions on a pad and that makes it very difficult and very easy to cross directions, quantities, and so forth. So four, if they handwrite it, six, if they computer generate it. So if it is an e-script, e-scripts are allowed if the doctor's office system has the software, schedule two to five and non-controls. Only doctor's offices that are registered with the DEA and have the specific software and have the authorization to do so, same thing with the pharmacy, they have to have the specific software and security set up. If they're allowed to do that, then they can e-prescribe anywhere from C2 to non-control. Some doctors don't have the capability of sending over C2s, but they can do everything else. DEA designation is allowed. So technically speaking in Michigan, you have to have the DAW handwritten in the doctor's initials. Well, guess what? It's allowed if they just check off on the computer for an e-script uh, for a DAW script. Watch out for Suboxone and drugs of like. You still have to have the special Suboxone number on that script that gets transmitted through a e-script. A lot of the systems that are sending this information over don't have it. So what you should do is simply call, get the doctor's information and hand write that in there to, to be legally responsible. If a pharmacy is, not, is out of stock of a C2, this question comes up all the time, and you cannot take that e-script that came to your pharmacy and send it over to another pharmacy. The doctor is gonna have to specifically e-prescribe it from their computer system over to that other pharmacy. Pay close attention to the notes at the bottom of e-scripts. There's errors that get made all the time. Sometimes the directions will come across take as directed, 
but in the bottom notes and small writing, I'll say take one tablet daily for seven days and then two tablets daily thereafter. So skim over the entire prescription, even know that eScripts have eliminated the legibility issues that we had with physicians, but there's a new set of technology errors that it can create if you're not careful. Are you allowed to take back prescriptions that have left the control of the pharmacist? So the law states that once it leaves the public, once it leaves the control of the pharmacist to protect the public, you cannot take that prescription back. So if it says right there, if it's left the control of the pharmacist, shall not be returned or exchanged for resale. So listen, the, the advice I give people on this all the time is how about if a dispensing error happens, you're not going to tell that patient, no, I can't take it back because it's the law. Of course, you're going to take that back. You just can't return it for resale. You gotta segregate that and damage that out. So use your judgment on this. You know, anytime it says, well, we can't take it back or this and that, you'll have patients that come, well, you signed me up for this automatic refill. I never asked for that. Mistakes happen. As a pharmacist, you have to use your judgment, but as long as you're not exchanging it for resale, again, you can justify your actions. Prescription drugs and labeling. These are all the things that are required on a label. If you are a new and upcoming pharmacy, a lot of times you have to check off each one of these to make sure that your label complies with state and federal regulations. Again, I, in my lecture, I have all the rules usually listed at the top. Uh, if I, my email address is my full name, Ronnie Fomia at att.net. If you want a hard copy of the lecture so that you have all these rules, you're more than welcome to. So the receipts, the receipts can be a blend. So if you have all this information on the label, you also, you can have it on a mixture of the label and the receipt um, and so forth. But the label has to contain all of these things by law. The receipt, as long as it's on the label, you don't necessarily have to have it on the receipt. It has to be a mixture of the two. But look at it and see, make sure that your labels, if you're an independent owner, that your labels comply with both state and federal regulations. Records, here are some changes that have occurred with record storage. Technically speaking, Invoices, billing statements, and things like that are good for two years. Prescriptions are good for five years, have to be stored for five years in the state of Michigan. Medicaid requires it for seven years. Medicare requires it for 10 years. So most pharmacies, what they do is they keep everything for 10 years because of the fact that there's all these different requirements. The problem that comes up is storage. Back rooms can overflow. Some pharmacies don't pay attention, don't give enough attention to those back room areas and if you get audited, if a state inspector comes in, it's very hard to comply with some of those things. My suggestion to you would be to make sure that you pay, visit the back room at least once a month, make sure that it's orderly, make sure it's clean, and have those discussions with your team members, uh, especially the front store. Make sure that they pay close attention to that back room and don't let anyone mess with that area. Um, it is so crucial for you to keep things in orderly fashion in case you get audited by a state, in case you get audited by a third party, it's very easy for that money to really add up um, if you don't pay enough attention to it. Now, we're gonna get to in just a few minutes um, further things on discussions about what we can do um, later on, what some of the rule changes have been. So electronic record keeping, this is a new change, but I'll tell you why this doesn't really impact us to a great extent. If after three years, you have a hard copy, the state of Michigan now allows you to make an electronic copy of that prescription, and that electronic copy then, what happens is it can be, you can get rid of the hard copy, but here's the problem. Third parties, uh, state of Michigan and Medicare though, require it for 10 years still. So really this rule is just the beginning process. Eventually, hopefully Medicare and some of these other federal laws will make it less stringent or allow us to keep these hard copies electronically, which will free up the back rooms a little bit more and make it less, especially when we're, we're going on 2015 right now, uh, so many things are electronic, it, where it's a little bit outdated to have to have these hard copy laws. Again, invoices, billing statements, two years, prescriptions in the state of Michigan are required for five, Medicaid seven, and Medicare requires everything for 10, and that's why usually most places keep it for 10. And then this new rule, you can keep a hard copy for three in Michigan scan it as long as the electronic copy of it is good then you can get rid of it but here's the problem medicare again requires it for 10 years the one of the biggest audit areas that a state inspector makes right now um, is in pharmacy is when they when they come in the doctor has to both initial or actually write the quantity on the controlled substance prescription 
and write the actual word quantity. So if it's number 30 on any controlled substance prescription, they're supposed to handwrite the T-H-I-R-T-Y 30 on there. And it's done to prevent diversion. To prevent diversion meaning that it, so that you don't, so a patient doesn't change a six to a nine and, and so forth. So how do you handle this? So how do you handle this? Just call the doctor. Doctor, you forgot to handwrite the, the number 30. Can I, you just tell me, did you really intend to write 30? Done, you can verify that and you can move on. I would never inconvenience a patient for that. So use your specific judgment on that. So what information can be changed on a control substance? This question comes up all the time. What can and can't be changed on a controlled substance prescription? You can add or change a patient's address. You can't change the patient name, dosage form. The question comes up all the time. Adderall or Adderall XR. To me, that's a dosage form change. Even though one is regular release and one is extended release, I would still accept that as a, a dosage form change. I can simply call and verify the doctor meant XR and move on with it. Don't inconvenience a patient. Drug quantity, you can change. Dr directions for use. And issue date, this is crucial because the issue date on a prescription uh, is so crucial that, that you can change that. The reason for that is that people don't understand what the rule says. There was two conflicting things that had come out. The first conflicting thing that had come out was that the DEA said that these are different things that you can change on a C3 through C5. Then a new rule came out about when a doctor writes for those three separate prescriptions, if they wanted to give a 30 day, 30 day, 30 day script, this says you cannot change those things. The DEA in 2007, 2008 addressed it and said, we understand there's confliction between the two, that what we said was first you can change all these things, including the issue date. And then another memo came out that said they can't, in the meantime, until the DEA addresses it, they're asking pharmacists just to simply use their professional judgment. And that's what I would suggest uh, for you as well. Use your judgment. I, in a sense, would you, the pharmacists are so scared to change these things, but my interpretation of the rules and regulations in Michigan, issue date according to the DEA. And if you Google DEA, what, just Google that where it says, what can you and can't you change on a C2 script? You'll actually see a document that comes up that shows you what you can and can't change. And that letter from the DEA from 2007 that stated that they know that there's an issue with the conflicting laws, and in the meantime, until they have, and I haven't seen anything where the DEA addresses it, to use a professional judgment. Partialing of a C2 med. A pharmacist may partially fill a C2. If you do partially fill a C2, you have to note on the hard copy, the face of the prescription that you did partial it in the quantity given, and the remaining amount has to be filled within 72 hours. So what does that mean? 72 hours is not three days, folks. So 72 hours, if you do it on a Monday at 10 a.m., you have technically until Thursday at 10 a.m. to fill that remaining amount. If you don't get it until 8 p.m. on Thursday night, you're past that 72 hour period. Once, if you can't fill it within that 72 hour period, two things have to happen. You cannot refill or fill the remaining amount. After that, that cancels the rest of the prescription. And two, you have to notify the prescriber, letting them know that you did not fill the rest of that prescription. Prescribers may issue as many Schedule II controlled substance prescriptions as they deem appropriate up to a 90-day supply. So if a doctor, technically speaking, wanted to get nine 10-day scripts, they could do that. The biggest mistake that's happening is that doctors are post-dating scripts. And what I mean by that, as I addressed earlier, is they, they have to have every prescription dated on the date that the patient was seen. What they would have to do then is just put do not fill until that specific date to make sure that it's uh, um, each date. And pharmacists legally are not allowed to fill that prescription until after that date has come. Now, can, doctor, can you call the doctor and say, doctor, I think you made a mistake. Can you, is this true? Can you change this date? You can do that. You definitely can change the do not fill date if it's written incorrectly. Now, follow these issues. So a lot of pharmacists think that it has to be a 30 day, 30 day, 30 day. It doesn't necessarily have to be 30 days. It could be up to as many prescriptions as they need up to a 90 day period. Again, no post dating. All the scripts should be dated on that date, but as long as they have the do not fill. So the first prescription won't have a date on there because it's the script that you're gonna fill right now. And the rest of the prescriptions would have to say, do not fill till January 29th, do not fill until February 29th and vice versa or whatever date uh, it may be. Mid-level prescribers. This comes up all the time. There's so much confusion. 
What can a nurse practitioner write for? What can a PA write for? What can they not write for? So let's clarify that. Mid-level prescribers are anybody, pretty much, that is under the delegation of a physician. So a mid-level prescriber, nurse practitioners, let's keep it simple, can prescribe for anything within from C3 to C5 and non-controls. C2s, generally speaking, it's made very rare that a nurse practitioner can write for a C2. A C2 is the only thing that a C2 that a nurse practitioner can write for is up to a seven day supply and the patient was discharged from a hospital or freestanding surgical center or hospice. They also have to be registered with the DEA and then also for mid-level prescribers, the doctor who's delegating doesn't have to sign it, but his name and DEA number have to be somewhere on that prescription. So if it's a hospital pad, their name has to be written on there along with their DEA number. And then the only person that has to actually physically sign it with a legal signature is the nurse practitioner. PAs, physician's assistants, on the other hand, have no limitations. They can write for anything in C2 to C5 without the seven day rule as a nurse practitioner. Same thing happens. The, the PA has to have their own DEA number, just like as a nurse practitioner. They also have to have the doctor's delegating name somewhere on there with their DEA number. The doctor, delegating doctor doesn't have to sign it, but the PA does have to sign it. Dispensing pharmacies. So now a controlled substance prescription um, and positive identification. So we come across this and this confuses a lot of people. What, who do you ask for ID and who you don't? And how about if you don't have that person's ID? So the, the law pretty much says that you have to ask for a positive ID, government ID, uh, or a Michigan state ID, um, driver's license or a Michigan ID, and that has to be transmitted um, right through the computer system. Now, if it's a child, you don't have to. You can put pretty much all zeros or whatever your computer system um, identifies. If it's a pet, you pretty much, you can, as long as you make identification that it's the correct owner and things like that, you can put all zeros in there. How about out-of-state IDs? Out-of-state IDs, you pretty much have to make, make positive photo identification and then it, depending on your computer system, you have to decide what you do with that. Most computer systems have you uh, put the Michigan driver's license number and then if it's an out-of-state, you make photo uh, identification, you know it's that patient, it's a legitimate prescription and that you can put all zeros or whatever your computer system allows. Now, the biggest mistake that's made is that social security numbers are to never be used. That was eliminated a few years ago and that should never be used. So the question comes up also is how about if it's a husband dropping off a prescription and their wife just got released from the hospital, they just had a baby, but he has his ID. Do you really stop that, that husband from taking that controlled substance prescription to his wife that just had a baby because they don't have their ID? No, the law allows a pharmacist to use their professional judgment, it does. So if you feel that the prescription is legitimate, it's written properly, and that you know that, that delaying giving that medication might cause undue stress and harm to a patient, then you fill that prescription and do whatever is necessary to take care of that customer. The law allows you as a professional to make that choice. Transferring of controlled substance prescriptions. Now, this is crucial here of understanding um, controls. Most of the time, the transferring pharmacist is not necessarily gonna go back to that hard copy if they're transferring out a controlled substance script and write void on it. But if you are transferring in, you should write the word transfer on it and follow this process. Again, I can, if you feel free to, I can send you a hard copy of the, the actual presentation. Keep this in mind. Technicians are not allowed to get hard copies. They're just of, of transfers of controlled substances or take phone-in scripts for controlled substances. They're just not allowed to do that. So can Michigan pharmacists fill from out-of-state doctors? This question comes up all the time. For non-controlled, there's no limitations. You can fill any prescription as long as you feel it's properly written from any doctor in the United States, along with mid-level prescribers, nurse practitioners, and PAs. And here's the thing, us being very close to Canada, you can fill only non-controlled scripts from Canadian doctors. You cannot fill controlled substances from Canadian doctors, only MDs and DOs, by the way. Um, you can't fill controlled substances from Canada, but you can fill all other non-controlled scripts. So again, what can you fill in Michigan? You can fill any non-controlled substance prescription from any mid-level prescriber, 
including from Canada, as long as they're a DO or an MD. For controlled substance prescriptions, we used to have a land bordering rule and regulation. That's gone now. So you can fill a controlled substance prescription if issued by an MD or a DO or a dentist only. So PAs and NPs from out of state are not allowed. And again, you cannot accept Canadian controlled substance prescriptions. So controlled substance, you can fill it from an MD, DO, or a dentist, and uh, from any state, and no nurse practitioners, no PAs, and mid-level prescribers, and no Canadian doctors. Storage of controlled substance scripts, the law for controlled substances says that you have to either keep them locked up, or you, have, you can interdisperse them throughout the pharmacy. So now let's talk about this for a second, and this comes up all the time as a pharmacist, there's been a case that had come up about different responsibilities that are out there. And we're going to get to uh, pharmacists in charge of responsibilities in just a minute. But the key thing that I stress, 70% of pharmacists do not realize that little battery that goes into those keypads. Some pharmacies have those. You can hear the noise come up. If the battery is low, it can cause, that's the number one reason it causes malfunctioning of those big safes. These are thousand dollars, very expensive safes. But if you don't have the proper battery life in there, uh, that simply can cause the, the, the safe to malfunction. You can punch in the code, you might hear the beeping, you might hear that strange sound co to come up, either the safe will unlock, or when you're going to lock it, it won't lock. So please make sure that you're changing those nine volt batteries often. So how about, can you take an oral prescription for a C2? You can take an oral script for a C2, um, you, the problem is the fact that you should limit it to, it should only be in emergencies, and you have to make sure that you identify, you, you gotta either call back that doctor for the number that's in your system or that you look up to say, doctor, did you just phone in this emergency cop, control substance C2 script? And then you can only give the amount that is required to get them through that emergency period. Now, are you gonna give Adderall as an emergency? Very unlikely. Uh, maybe some pain medications, Percocet, oxycodone, for it may be a three or four day supply. But here's the thing, that doctor within seven days, he has to at least have it postmarked within a seven day period to reach you. That heart, he has to reduce it to writing and get that prescription to you within seven days um, by providing an individual, so reduce it to writing and then put on there authorization for emergency dispensing and the date of the oral order. So. Please make sure that you follow that. Now, if the doctor, for whatever reason, never sends it to you, you tried your best to reach out to them and repeatedly reach out to them, you do have to report that to the state and the DEA that that doctor never sent that uh, oral order or the hard copy to you for that emergency dispensing. Again, this is in my notes. If you take a look at it, you'll be able to tell what is available and what's not available. Schedule change. Um, and tramadol was changed from a schedule for non-control to a schedule for on August 18th, 2014. Hydrocodone was changed on October 6th. And we know all the issues that had happened with, uh, with hydrocodone. Pharmacies, for whatever reason, are having a hard time. There should be no out-of-stock issues. Pharmacies just are not properly ordering hydrocodone. And the problem that we're facing in the state of Michigan is that there's been a big shift. And this shift has caused major issues throughout the state throughout the country, to be honest with you, because pharmacists are so scared of dispensing, there's more stringent requirements to record keep now because you have to have an exact count. You have to use a 222 form to order it. And also, there's more scrutiny on the physicians. If you look at it, what did the DEA tell us with hydrocodone? The DEA took away the doctor's ability to write refills. They took away the ability of the doctor to phone it in because it is out of control. There's hydrocodone in products, combination products of such, are a major issue throughout the country. 99% of the world hydrocodone is consumed in the United States. And this is just a massive number. It really is. My suggestion to you is use common sense. Um, you know, you should order enough for your patients as long as you have that, develop that relationship with your patients to know who they are. You should watch out for red flags. You know, are they going to multiple doctors? Are they going to multiple pharmacies? Are they exhibiting strange behavior? Are they going to further doctors out of the area? Are they traveling long distances to come to you? Those are all red flags that we look for. 
do your due diligence is my suggestion to you but at the same time it is unacceptable what has happened with hydrocodone there's a lot of people that legitimately need it that are not getting it right now so what's the fear out there the fear of pharmacists are so scared that there's going to be scrutiny on them it is a lot harder to fill it the record keeping i mean some pharmacies could fill 20 to 30 scripts a day now that you have to go back into a log a book on keeping that and some pharmacies have to go back and do a back count on every single tablet that's dispensed so it's a lot harder to dispense but i'll be honest with you it was so necessary and so needed this this law is a good thing but the way that i believe that pharmacists are dropping the ball is that one they're not properly ordering it they're not keeping it in stock for their normal patients and it's causing issues throughout the state and patients are searching for it we get you'll, you'll get patients calling multiple pharmacies and you know how hard that is these patients don't know the worst thing that i believe that a pharmacist can do is lie to a patient i i i think that it's a cop-out i will never allow uh, any of my pharmacists or uh, team members to lie to a customer saying i don't have it even though we do just to get over it you have to have those honest discussions with the customer with the patient tell them what the issue is and either tell them the truth or help guide them in the right direction maps maps is something that is underutilized maps goes is different than what that identifier is when we fill a controlled substance prescription people think it's when you put in that id when you're filling a control that's something completely separate. MAPS goes by name and date of birth. So anytime you, you fill a prescription, it goes by name and date of birth, it gets uploaded to the state of Michigan, usually at the end of the business day. And what happens is, now if you don't spell that name properly, if you spell Cheryl with an S and Cheryl with a C because you made a mistake, that's not gonna upload to her profile correctly in MAPS. Again, the two identifiers for MAPS is the name, and the date of birth. As long as you have those properly and you're consistent, then the whole MAPS profile will be consistent. But if you make an error with the date of birth, or if you spell even the first name one letter off, the MAPS profile will not work. So we talked about the epidemics that are happening um, in the, the United States. 15,000 people die every year of overdoses involving painkillers. One in 20 people in the United States reported using painkillers. In, in one month, there was enough prescription painkillers prescribed in 2010 for every American adult to give them painkiller around the clock. That's just an unbelievable number. Um, prescription drug addiction epidemic. If you look at overall what this number represents, overdose and drug induced, drug induced in general, it's, it's ranking up there with motor vehicle fatalities. That's just an unreal number as well. If you look at how many people are dying because of drug addiction and overdose. Uh, it's, think about how many people you hear about car accidents every day that are happening. This has skyrocketed since 1999. Obviously there's a problem. And as pharmacists and health professionals, we have a responsibility to address this issue and to do whatever it takes to help the general public. Again, three out of four prescription drug overdoses um, are because of narcotic pain medications resulting in 15,500 deaths every single year. 52 million people in the United States over the age of 12 have used a prescription non-medically over the past, in their lifetime. Uh, prescription painkillers sit at the heart of the issue as we discussed. I mean, think about it. Dilaudid, methadone, 30% of all deaths come from methadone. Methadone is a long-acting opiate. It stays in the system forever. And a lot of times when there's these huge increases in dosage, a lot of times patients don't realize it. And of course, as we know, it can cause respiratory depression, as can all the opiates in large doses, and it can lead to death. And that's the problem too, is that people over time, it's such an unfortunate thing, is that over time, people need more and more of this stuff to get the same effect. And it is, and you, you see it, you see the behaviors in the pharmacy um, and so forth. But I'm gonna be giving a separate lecture on this very topic. I also see it with Adderall. Adderall, the three main causes of addiction in prescriptions right now are opiates, um, and I believe stimulants such as uh, Adderall and drugs of such. Adderall is becoming a major, major, major issue. It's not only being used by children now, it's being used more by adults than it is by children. And it is a just as addictive drug as opiates are, and it's becoming a rising problem out there because people are not using it just for attention deficit. Adults are using it to be able to compete and work longer hours, and students are using it to study longer, but at what cost? 
arrhythmias are happening more often now in younger adults and so forth. So just issues out there. Pharmacist in charge law. So here's what happens. As of September 30th, the state of Michigan, you have to report um, anytime there's a pharmacist in charge change in the state of Michigan. So if you are a PIC and you go to a new pharmacy, you've got to work with your pharmacy supervisor or district manager to make sure that they're reporting to the Board of Pharmacy that you are the new PIC in that store. Where this resulted from is that there were pharmacists that uh, in the state of Michigan, that there was issues with compounding certain drugs. These compounded drugs ended up leading to deaths uh, throughout the country. And this stemmed from now, okay, we're gonna hold people more responsible. What this is saying as of September 30th, is that the PIC and the pharmacy license, the overall pharmacy license, is gonna be responsible for compliance and following rules and regulations to make sure that their staff is compliant and following rules and regulations. Uh, PIC may be a pharmacist charged for more than one location. They have to work an average of eight hours a week at that one store, at any of the stores that are named PIC for. So you can be a PIC at more than one pharmacy, but you have to have uh, eight hours of average per week and you have to notify the board within 30 days. So if you are a PIC and you have a weak staff pharmacist, you gotta make sure that you hold them accountable. You gotta work with your, your field managers and your team leaders say, you know what, this, this person eventually is gonna hurt you because if you're not at the pharmacy and you get inspected and there's issues in the pharmacy, it's gonna come back on the pharmacy and the pharmacist in charge, not necessarily the staff pharmacist. So you have to do something about it. If you have a pharmacist out there that is not doing their job and holding their team accountable, following rules and regulations, the PIC is gonna come back on you and you don't wanna put yourself in that situation. The PIC is gonna supervise pretty much all activities. They're gonna, they're gonna enforce and oversight policies and procedures. And then also, you should know every company, every pharmacy should have a delegated task for their technicians. And it has to be posted, by the way. So if you, you don't know where this is or it's not posted, you're putting yourself at risk because of the fact that you're pretty much not defining what your technicians can and can't do. So when you go back to your pharmacy, find this delegated task and procedures and make sure it's posted. You know, good practice is to have all your technicians sign off on it to make sure that they realize it has to be posted somewhere. And if a state inspector comes in, they will ask you about that. The pharmacy technician licensor. So now this has been changed. This got pushed back to June now. So it is. it was initially effective December 22nd, but it did get pushed back to June as enforcement. The applications though are available now uh, for a technician to apply to be a, uh, for their license. So these are the things that are defined as needing a license. If you assist the dispensing process, what does that mean? How about the technician that's at pickup? Is, is that assisting in the dispensing process? If that's all they do, to me, it is. Handling of transfer of prescriptions except controlled substances, as we discussed, compounding of certain drugs, contacting prescribers um, for clarification, but it can't do drug review or clinical therapeutic interpretation, and then receiving verbal orders for prescription drugs and not controlled substances. Three types of main licenses. You have a limited license, a temporary license, and a full license. Now, if you've had a technician that's been working forever in your pharmacy and they have at least a thousand hours, they're more likely gonna apply for a limited license. But the problem with the limited license is that it's only valid at that pharmacy. And here's the issue. We're trying to get that changed and I'm hoping that it'll be changed. So if that's gonna cause a shortage of technicians eventually. So you even though that they might be licensed. If they wanna work at another pharmacy, even within the same chain, they have to apply and make sure that uh, they're allowed to work, have a separate license for that. Full licensure is the best thing. I mean, then there's no limitations on, on that. Temporary license is, for example, if you have a new hire, they're gonna apply for a temporary license and they're gonna have 210 days to take this state exam to say that they, they are qualified and they pass what's needed and they're gonna move from temporary to a full license. You're never gonna move from a temporary to a limited license. A limited license, if you take, if they've met those thousand hours and they've been working in the pharmacy, and by the way, the employer just simply has to attest to that. They don't have to go and prove every single hour. If the employer comes out there and says, yes, they've been here this period of time, it's a thousand hours, that's what the person needs to apply for a limited license. Now. 
Now, if they've taken past the state exam, then they can go to a full licensure, and that in itself um, would be positive. So if you look here, though, is the biggest problem I see, again, remember this, you can go from a temporary license to a full license after that 210 days. If you don't pass that exam in 210 days, you can no longer work on the pharmacy because you're not going to be, you're not, it's not going to be a temporary license. It's only valid for 210 days. A lot of people, if they've been around forever and they do that thousand hours, then they're valid to use that uh, thousand hours. They're going to pass some employee training, but right now we're also trying to define, and that's why it's good that it got pushed back until June. What is the board going to recognize as employee-based training and what is it not going to recognize as employee-based training? This is the key. I think if you really want to have um, fully staffed pharmacies, you really want to push for a full licensure where there's no limitation on which pharmacy you can go to. Temporary license, you can only work at that pharmacy that you applied for. Limited license, you can only apply at that pharmacy you, you applied for. A full licensure is where you can pretty much work at any pharmacies within that change because you have your full license. Um, but again, this is going to be clarified more. The applications are now available right online, so technicians can start applying now to get their licenses, and I suggest that they start doing that. 20 hours of CE is required every two years. Uh, now, please note that if you are a nationally certified technician, that's separate from being licensed in the state of Michigan. You can actually be certified but not licensed. So you can actually be licensed, but not certified. Um, so please be aware that just because you're certified doesn't mean that you are licensed. And eventually every two years, technician is gonna have to amount to 20 hours of CE credit. A little bit on customized packaging and how long are these prescriptions good for once they are dispensed. Any customized package is pretty much saying you can add two different drugs to a package, the same package, and uh, to make it easier for a patient. A lot of times you'll see these pouches, you'll see multi-dose blister packs. Anytime two separate drugs touch each other in the same container, it's only good for 60 days from dispensing. Single-dose blister packs that are in long-term care facilities have these. Once a drug is taken out of its original packaging and put into these single-dose blister packs, it's good for six months. Script Pro, a lot of pharmacies are familiar with Script Pro. Anytime you add a drug to a Script Pro machine, you have to change the label on the cell to one year from the date that you added the drug, or if the expiration date is sooner based on the bottle. If the expiration date on the actual manufacturer bottle is three years from now, still not valid. You have to put one year from the date that you dispensed, uh, that you added those drugs to the cell. And that's a big issue because a lot of pharmacies are not changing the cell expiration date to match that one year. So you add a drug to that script pro, put a new cell label on there one year from the date that you add that. Return to stock vials are becoming a hot issue in the state of Michigan. Um, usually now you have to have certain information on there. You have to have the drug name, strength. You have to have the, uh, you know, expiration date usually goes one year from the day that it's in that vial. For most companies, it's six months that you're going to damage them out. Also, you have to have the manufacturer name on the return to stock container. So these are different things that are out there that you got to pay close attention to. Rule 20. Rule 20 pretty much tells you that you have the responsibility and the right to say no to a prescription if you feel that the prescription is not written properly or it can cause harm to a patient. And what Rule 20, it's 338.490, and it's, the, uh, it's known as Rule 20, what it's pretty much telling you a couple of different things is that you have corresponding responsibility in the state of Michigan, or the DEA says the pharmacist has corresponding responsibility, and what corresponding responsibility means is that just because a doctor writes it and you keep filling it doesn't mean that you're free from respons being responsible for that patient if harm or, or addiction or some issue happens or diversion happens. So just because the prescription is written properly from a licensed practitioner and you keep filling it, you have that corresponding responsibility to make sure it's being used properly and it's not being diverted and so forth. So, but what Rule 20 gives the pharmacist the power in the state of Michigan to say, you know what, hold on one second. I don't think this prescription is medically necessary. I, re I feel that it can cause harm to a patient. If you determine that, you have that right to say no. And it's not, it's not easy to do that. And of course, use your professional judgment. Don't do that just for the sake of doing it. But you have to understand where corresponding responsibility is. It's a hot issue right now that you have that right to prevent diversion. You have that right to make sure that controlled substance prescriptions are filled legitimately. 
you have that right to make sure that your pharmacy is following all rules and regulations. Um, also, you gotta make sure that you have that prescriptions that states in there that you have to communicate information over to patients. The very first time that's a new drug to a patient, you either have to counsel that patient, talk to them about what you feel is appropriate to properly take that medication. And if they're not present, by simply giving literature on that, it complies with that. So please make sure that you, you pay close attention to this bottom part of it as well, that you have to communicate certain information on new scripts that the patient has never had before. And if they're not there, you can give literature to comply with that. Whatever you feel is necessary so that patient takes that pre uh, prescription properly is crucial. And that's also under the professional responsibility rule and regulation. Pharmacist delegation. A pharmacist, as I mentioned before, you have to make sure that you post your rules and regulations in Michigan. You have your delegated task, what you allow your technicians to do, make sure they understand that they sign off on it, and also that it's posted in your pharmacy. And as I said before, you have to provide those written procedures and protocols. Now what's changed also is that electronic references are allowed. Before, only you had to have two references in the pharmacy. And those two references, you can have now electronic versions of a drug facts and comparisons and a drug interactions. Before you actually had to have the actual copies there, now you can keep them electronically. Same thing with the rules and regulations in Michigan. Those gray and yellow books, you, you, could, you had to have copies of that. But as long as you have access to them online, you comply with that. There's different things out there that for utilization of unused prescriptions are allowing, if you apply for certain special licenses to take back these drugs, that rule that we discussed earlier, but you know what, I would avoid this as much as possible unless you know very much. These are voluntary programs, but you have to have special licenses to be able to do that and pay attention to that. I just wanna make you aware of that. Same thing with disposal of controlled substances. Pharmacies may participate, but they have to have a modification to their DEA license to be able to take back uh, prescriptions, controlled substances, dispose of them. Um, unless you do that, you have that special modification, you cannot do that. Now, I highly suggest you Google FDA, uh, uh, disposal of prescription drugs or DEA. There's wonderful documents. There's actually a whole list of drugs that have to be flushed on the toilet that's recommended to be flushing because of harm to patients if you simply throw them out or put them in, in coffee grinds. Certain opiates are recommended to, to flush them down the toilet because of the fact that even one tablet can severely harm a child or a pet. So simply Google it and you'll see the FDA website or the DEA website on what drugs and the proper way of disposing of certain prescriptions. Um, prescriptions, auto-injectable and epinephrine now, pharmacists can actually dispense the school boards. That's allowed in Michigan if a school board needs it for a stock supply to keep auto-injectable epinephrine EpiPens and, and different drugs of such. Um, it is allowed for them to use that as the name instead of a specific name. Um, there's other laws that I'll get to in further lectures about opiate antagonists and so forth. Approval investigation. Now it, you can still, uh, Board of Pharmacy can open an investigation after a grace period of four years before there was a limit. Now an, a permits an investigation made more than four years after an alley, uh, alleged violation. That's allowed now for them to do that. Now, conflict of interest. What this says is that a board member cannot participate or vote in an issue, say they work for a chain pharmacy, and their chain pharmacy is being is under investigation for something, they cannot participate in, in voting on that issue that's in front of them. Also, removal of community service has been removed from an available sanction. Uh, if pharmacist is sanctioned for, for some reason, the board now cannot give community service. Intern hours were changed now from requiring 1,000 hours to 1,006 hours, effective back on September 30th. So interns should be aware of what their requirements are so that they can apply for licensure in the state of Michigan. The compounding law, I'm gonna have a separate lecture on this as well. And pretty much what this stemmed was that issue I addressed earlier about how patients were being harmed throughout the country because of a sterile compound that wasn't sterile causing infection and death in patients. And what this pretty much says is it defining what is a compounding pharmacy and what is not a compounding pharmacy. And any pharmacy that compounds sterile products has to be USB certified by September 30th of 2015. Right now it's gonna be business as usual, but be aware that especially if you are a compounding pharmacy or specialty pharmacy, there are strict, strict guidelines for what has happened. This unfortunately happened in the state of Michigan, this compounding pharmacy that one of the issues that happened. 
And this is something that was not acceptable. And this is something that I think is completely necessary to protect the public. Pilot project, something that was being fought vigorously because people were saying, oh my gosh, it's gonna take my job away. Um, you know, what pilot projects were allowed are maximum 10 pilot projects now. And people were thinking that this is going to end as computers are going to be able, allowed to dispense and it's going to take away jobs from pharmacists. That's not true. Now there's a maximum of 10 pilot projects going on. The department is going to establish the process and the pilot is going to uh, be for about 18 months. I testified in front of the House of Representatives in, in regards to this and I'm in favor of it. I think that it's a great thing to try new things and new ways of getting things out and, and learning new things about technology. We should not fear this issue at all. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I really hope that you took away certain things from this. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I hope that now you understand some of our common rules and regulations in the state of Michigan. Uh, I, if you want me to send me your, send me, um, send you my presentation, I'll be more than happy to. Uh, just email me at ronnyfomia at att.net. That's R-O-N-Y. F as in Frank, O-U, M as in Mary, I-A, at att.net. Again, Ronnie Fomia at att.net.